welcome to our webinar on the science of industrial mixing. Um, without more ado, let's get started. I'd like to say a few words about myself. Um, my name is Richard Grenville. I've worked in the field of mixing for nearly 40 years. I'm an adjunct professor at Rowan University in New Jersey and at the University of Delaware. And the material we're going to cover today is an abbreviated version of one of the lectures from that course. I'm a chartered engineer, which is the UK equivalent of being a professional engineer, a fellow of the ICME in the UK, and also a fellow of the AICHE in the USA. I'm a former president of the North American Mixing Forum and a winner of the NAMP Award in 2017. So, um, few housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded so we can send you a recap afterwards. Your camera and audio have been turned off. However, the chat and Q&A functions are enabled for, you to, enabled for you to submit questions and comments, which I'll answer at the end of the presentation. And follow up, obviously I'll follow up with anyone who's, uh, who I'm not able to get to today. Uh, lastly, I'd like to ask for your help to complete a brief survey at the end of the presentation as this is going to help us improve the quality and the content of our, our presentations in, in the future. Uh, so let's get started. Um, here's our agenda. So we're going to say a few words about uh, the company. Um, then we're going to talk about the impeller geometries, the shape of blades that we use in low viscosity, turbulent mixing, and some conventional wisdom about how we describe the performance of these impellers, how they put energy into the fluid. Then we're going to look at how, how we design pumps. So a mixer is a pump. It's a machine in a tank that's moving fluid. So the rules that we've learned as chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, about um, sizing of pumps and for pipelines, we can apply those same ideas to the characterization of impellers. Then we're going to look at the conventional wisdom characterization, and then we're going to look at a, a test performance, specifically looking at shear, which is uh, the, the production of droplets in a liquid-liquid dispersion. What we're going to end up saying is that the conventional wisdom is wrong, something's missing, and we're going to look at that missing aspect of impeller performance and um, uh, hopefully pull everything everything together. Then we're going to look at uh, impeller selection, energy distribution. We're going to look at some developments we've made recently regarding uh, a look, what is a low shear impeller, some conclusions, and then we'll have some questions and answers. So, um, so X, SPX Flow Mixing Solutions is a worldwide organization. We have five brands under our corporate um, umbrella, and they're Lightning, Philadelphia Mixing Solutions, now, now Philadelphia, Plenty, Stelzer, and UU Technic. So Philadelphia is the most recent addition to the, the Mixing Solutions uh, stable. We were acquired by Mixing Solutions in, in, in May of last year. So these brands represent a wide range of mixing applications across the process industries, including minerals and mining, biotechnology, paints and coatings, as well as nutrition and health fields. Anywhere where there's fluid mixing going on, we have the technology to uh, address those, those mixing issues. So from a technology point of view, we have four labs where we're doing fundamental research to develop new mixing technologies and also to carry out targeted testing for customers to improve their processes. So we have a, a, a lot of very smart people, long history in the field of mixing, those people have a, a, a strong background in, in the field of mixing. And I believe that we really are the world leaders in, in de delivering mixing technology to our customers. So the, the material that we're going to talk about today has been written up uh, in, and published in Chemical Engineering Magazine in August 2017. Uh, I, I My colleague, Jason Giacomelli, uh, Philadelphia Mixing Solutions, now SPX Flow Mixing Solutions, and two colleagues from a lab in the UK, Gustavo Padron and David Brown. So the, uh, I'm going to cover a lot of material, but it's it's covered in this article in Chemical Engineering Magazine, obviously going to present some, some new material at the end. So we have different shapes of blades that we use for our mixing applications. 
And the first that we're going to look at are called hydrofoils. So the blades are profiled. So the low solidity hydrofoils. So what do we mean by solidity? If we look at the area covered by the blades and the area of the circle swept as the impeller spins, the area covered by the blade is small compared to the area of the circle. So it's, it's low solidity. Then we have medium solidity hydrofoils. Uh, obviously, more area is covered by the blades. And then we have anti-ragging impellers, which are used in wastewater treatment. And I'll, I'll show you what they're um, aimed to avoid in, in a minute. So this number, this dimensionless group, the power number, is essentially a drag coefficient. And it represents the relationship or, between the power drawn by the impeller, its speed, its diameter, and the density of the fluid. So as the area of the impeller projected into the direction of flow increases, the power number increases. So the conventional wisdom in the world of mixing says that hydrofoils are high flow and low shear. So this is an example of a hydrofoil impeller taken out of a wastewater treatment plant. And the, that gooey stuff hanging on the shaft is, is fibers, hair, paper, and as it builds up over, over time, it, it reduces the, abil the impeller's ability to pump and also adds weight to the end of the, end of the shaft, which affects the mechanical performance of the system. So these anti-ragging impellers are designed to prevent the buildup of these fibrous materials as the impeller spins in the, in the fluid, in, in the wastewater. So then we have pitched and flat plate turbines. So these are simply a piece of plate uh, bolted onto a hub or welded onto a hub at a pitch plate turbines are typically at 45 degrees. We also have 30 degree and 60 degree um, options sometimes. And then we have a vertical blade, 90 degrees. As you can see, the, um, the power numbers increased because the area um, presented by the blade into the direction of flow has increased. So then we have disc turbines, which are commonly used in gas dispersion. Um, we have uh, the Rushton turbine, which has a disc, which is uh, 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 and vertical blades. Then we have the Smith turbine, which has a disc with half pipe blades. And then we have uh, blades which are parabolic in shape. And there's a reason for this evolution of blade shape, which I'm not going to go into today. Um, we can maybe have a, a webinar in the future on gas liquid mixing and, and explain this historical evolution of blade shape. But the conventional wisdom says that these type of impellers are low flow and high shear. Then we have high shear dispersers. These are um, high shear. That's so we have an impeller that looks like a circular saw blade with the teeth bent up and down, high shear disperser. Um, we call that an R500. And then we have a bar turbine. These are commonly used in the, um, in the paint industry um, called the R510. So these are high shear dispersers. So we've got these impellers. We've got this, this qualitative um, description of their performance, high flow, low shear, high flow, low shear. How can we, as engineers, we want to be able to quantify those characteristics. So how are we going to do that? So we're going to use two dimensionless numbers, power number and the flow number, and two geometric ratios, um, which we'll explain in a second. So the power number I mentioned already is a drag coefficient. P is the power, rho is the density of the liquid, N is the rotational speed of the adding shaft, and D is the diameter of the impeller. So if you use a conventional or consistent set of units like the SI system, uh, you can get the power number without any uh, correction factors required. The flow number is the flow generated by the impeller, which we can measure, divided by the speed and the diameter cubed. Again, it's a dimensionless number. Then we have the impeller to tank diameter ratio. T is the tank diameter. And then we have the um, ratio of the impeller diameter to the projected blade height, the, the, the projected height at the tip, 
So I'm just going to show you like some show and tell uh, right now. So this is a hydrofoil. Uh, it's made out of laser printed, out of glass filled nylon. So you can see the diameter and you can see the projected height. Uh, this, is a, this is a 45 degree pitch blade turbo and its projected height is a, as a um, as a ratio to the diameter of the impeller is smaller. It, it has a larger projected height. Diameter divided by the projected height is a smaller number. X is smaller for the pitch blade turbine than it is for the hydrofoil. And this turns out to be quite an important um, parameter which we can control in terms of the way the uh, agitator puts energy into the system. OK, so let's think about pumps. In pipe flow, the energy dissipated in the flowing fluid is equal to the flow rate multiplied by the pressure drop. And I'm using H to represent pressure drop, delta H, because P I'm using as for power. So if we express the flow rate and the head, the pressure drop in terms of the velocity and the pipe diameter, and the head in terms of the velocity, the pipe diameter, and the length of the pipe, the friction factor comes in. And if we simplify that equation, the, the term circled in red at the front of the equation is determined by the geometry and the flow regime. Reynolds number and the pipe roughness, are we in laminar or turbulent flow? The pipe length to diameter ratio, L over DP, and whether there are any fittings, elbows, valves, flow meters, which usually we account for by adding a certain number L over DPs, to uh, to the equation to account for the pressure drop in in the device. So if we look at a pump, this is the this is the performance curve. This is the the pressure. This is the flow rate. So when the valve is off is closed and there's no flow, this pump this is the pressure that the pump will generate. And as we open the valve, the pressure it generates will drop off. The green curve is the system curve, taking account of the pressure drop through the system. So as the flow rate goes up, uh, the pressure we need to move the fluid goes up. And where these two curves intersect, that's our operating point. So if we look at the, um, this is the pressure that, that the pump must generate. This is the efficiency curve. So we're operating close to the best efficiency point of the pump. And here's the brake horsepower. This is the power input by the machine, not the energy dissipated in the flowing fluid. So if we convert our flow rate and head to SI units, it says that the energy being dissipated by the flowing fluid is about 25 kilowatts or 33 horsepower. The brake horsepower is 66. So the efficiency of this pump is just around um, 50%. So the question, from a pump point of view, from a pumping point of view, we would like to maximize the kinetic energy of the flowing fluid. But the question is, where's that? Where's the rest of that energy going? Well, it's being wasted from a pumping point of view. Where is it going? So let's think about Reynolds number. In pipe flow, the Reynolds number is the density of the fluid divided by its dynamic viscosity multiplied by the uh, velocity multiplied by the pipe diameter. So we can define a Reynolds number for many systems, like thinking, for example, of a, of a particle settling in a liquid. We can calculate a Reynolds number for that particle based on its diameter and its settling velocity. So we need to be able to define an appropriate velocity and a length scale to use when we're calculating the Reynolds number in the stirred tank. So the velocity is the tip speed, which is pi times the speed times the diameter. The length scale is the impeller diameter. So if we substitute those into the into the equation for Reynolds number, this is the equation that those of you familiar with mixing will, will recognize. Density, viscosity, speed, and diameter squared. And we're simply dropping the pi as a, as a convention. Doing the same thing then for the power input, substituting for the tip speed and the diameter of the impeller, the power is the x, which is a constant, density, speed cube, diameter to the five. And so x in this case is the power number. And just like friction factor 
L over D in, in pipe flow, it's determined by the flow regime and the geometry, the Reynolds number, the impeller diameter, blade width, number of blades, the impeller position relative to the base of the vessel, and whether or not there are baffles in the vessel. So if we look at what's going on in the turbulent and the laminar regimes, in the turbulent regime, power number's constant, and we've talked a few times now about this equation. In the laminar regime, power number's inversely proportional to Reynolds number, as friction factor is in laminar flow, in, in pipe flow. But there's a constant of proportionality, K sub P, which is a function of the geometry of the impeller. Um, so the power drawn by the impeller in laminar flow is proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. So it, it's important if we're designing a system that we know is going to operate in laminar flow, it's important to know what the viscosity of the fluid is. So just one more uh, piece of evidence to say that mixes of pumps. Here's the pipe Reynolds number versus friction factor chart. There's the laminar regime where friction factor is inversely proportional to Reynolds number. Here's the turbulent regime where friction factor is constant. And the as the rough pipe roughness increases, the friction factor go goes up. And the red curve down here is for smooth tube. So it's the equivalent of operating in an unbaffled vessel in the turbulent machine. Over here, we have the power number versus Reynolds number chart. Turbulent regime, power number's constant. Laminar regime, power number's inversely proportional to Reynolds number. And the value of Kp that we mentioned before is equal, is essentially the power number when Reynolds number equals one. And as you can see with these uh, impellers, the Kp va varies between about 50 and 70. If we are looking at a helical ribbon operating in the laminar regime, the Kp value would be about 300. So mixes of pumps. How can we measure the power, the flow, and the efficiency of a, an impeller in a stirred tank? Well, in pipe flow, it's pretty easy. We can measure the power input to the fluid by looking at the power input from the motor of the pump, measuring the torque on the uh, pump shaft. We can measure the flow rate, we can measure the pressure drop. So we need to be able to measure the motor power if, to, to um, get the pump efficiency. It's, it's the P delta H divided by the mechanical energy input by the pump. So how are we gonna do the same thing for a stirred tank? So the first thing we need to measure is the power. Different ways of doing this. Uh, the way we do it in our lab is to use an air bearing. So this orange uh, blob here is the, bot is the motor. Here's the motor shaft. And there's a disc which sits on top of a series of holes through which we pump compressed air. So the motor is, is floating, <laughs> hovering on uh, a cloud of compressed air. So it's a frictionless bearing. Then we have a load cell, and we know the distance from the, the attachment point to the center of the shaft. So we can measure the force required to prevent the motor from spinning as, as the sh shaft and the impeller are turning. Then we have a magnetic tachometer uh, and a display. So how do we treat the, th this, this measurement? So the torque on the shaft is the force, which we're measuring with our load cell, multiplied by the radius from the center of the shaft to the, the load cell attachment point. And the power drawn by the impeller is the angular velocity multiplied by the torque. So I measure the torque, I measure the power, I, me I, I calculate the power, and then I can calculate the power number. And we do this, repeat this for a given impeller, over several speeds, look at the average, look at the standard deviation, and just see how reproducible our, our measurements are. And as I said, there are there are other ways to do this, but this is a very reliable, um, very robust way of, of measuring power that we use in our lab. So now we need to measure the flow. And there are different ways of doing this, non-intrusive, don't affect the flow in the tank. The first is a device called the laser Doppler anemometer. Second is a particle image velocimeter. So the flow that the flows that we're seeing are time dependent. There's a pulse in the flow every time the blade passes the measurement plane. So the first thing we're going to do is average those velocities. And then we're going to integrate or add the, those that we know the area that's represented by the through which each velocity is, is, is traveling. That velocity times that area 
gives us the local flow at each position along the radius of the blade. We add those flows together and that gives us the total flow. And that's basically what this equation here is saying. It's integrating across the radius of the blade around its circumference, the, the average velocity at each of, each of those locations. The flow number is the, is the flow that we've measured divided by the speed and the diameter cubed. And again, we're going to repeat this experiment uh, measurement over a variety of number of speeds, look at the reproducibility, take the average, look at the standard deviation. And I should mention that this um, movie that we're looking at was presented by a guy called David Brown, actually one of the co-authors of the chemical engineering article I mentioned, a uh, conference in Canada in, in 2010. So that's how we're going to get to the flow. But that the magnitude of the flow alone doesn't tell us the whole story because we can control where the flow is directed through the appropriate choice of the impeller. So these are three, three pitch blade turbines, 45 degrees, one half, one third and one quarter of the tank diameter. As the impeller gets smaller, the flow becomes more axial. If we were looking at the, dis the discharge velocity of a Rushton turbine or a flat blade turbine, that would be discharging out towards the wall of the tank. We'd have radial flow. So when we talk about what we want the impeller to do, one of the things we need to be um, considering is where do we want the flow to go? And, and that's part of the conversation that we have to have in terms of choosing the appropriate impellers for, for your process. So let's plot the flow number versus the power number. So this is these are data measured again by David Brown at the lab in the UK, fluid mixing processes. So the orange diamonds are narrow blade hydrofoils from a number of vendors, including the Lightning A310, Cheminier HE3, and some other vendors. The green diamonds are pitch blade turbines. The yellow diamond is a flat blade turbine. Pale blue diamonds are Rushtons. And the green diamond, uh, or bright green diamond, is a high shear disperser or sawtooth blade. So we can quite accurately estimate the, power, the flow number for an axial flow impeller if we know its power number. And the power number is much easier to measure than the flow number. Um, Rushton turbines, the flow number is about 0.63. So uh, uh, already looking at this chart, if you look at the pitch blade turbine with a similar flow number, about 0.63, it will, at the same speed and the same diameter, it will create the same amount of flow as the Rushton for about one fifth the power input. So where do we want the flow to go? Then we have the high shear disperser, which has a very low flow number, very low power number. We're not using it to pump. We're using it to create shear and disperse a second phase, whether it's a liquid, an emissible liquid, uh, breakup, uh, agglomerates of solids. But we, we don't necessarily want it to be a good pump. So that's our relationship between flow numbers uh, and power numbers. This is actually work in progress. We're, we're still looking at this. And one of the things that we, we found is that there does seem to be a relationship between the impeller to tank diameter ratio affecting the flow number. Uh, if we round off the exponents to a quarter and minus a six, the standard deviation in terms of being able to estimate the um, the flow number is about plus or minus 6%. As I said, this is work in progress. We're still looking at this. So the next thing we have to think about, we want to be able to calculate the velocity of the flow leaving the impeller. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to estimate the flow that's generated by the impeller using the flow number and, div and divide it by the discharge area. So for a, a radial flow impeller, the discharge area is the wall of a vertical cylinder. And for an axial flow impeller pumping downwards or upwards for that matter, it's the, it's the area of a cylinder. So we need to know the velocity in order to be able to calculate the hydraulic power, the flow rate times the head times the, times the density divided by two. So <coughs> hydraulic efficiency, we're defining it in exactly the same way as we do for a pump. It's the kinetic energy of the flowing fluid divided by the mechanical energy input by the, the um, machine. So the power input by the machine, we're going to calculate using the power number with the equation we've seen before. 
The hydraulic power, you need the flow, flow number, speed, diameter cubed, and the discharge velocity, which is simply the flow divided by the discharge area squared. Discharge area for the axial flow impeller is pi by 4d squared. Discharge area for radial flow impeller is pi times the, project, uh, the actual projected height of the blade multiplied by the diameter. So we do some uh, algebra. And for a radial flow impeller, the efficiency is 1 over 2 pi squared, flow number cubed over power number, impeller diameter to projected height squared. And for a axial flow impeller, 8 over pi squared multiplied by the flow number cubed divided by the power number. So let's plot hydraulic efficiency versus power number. And this is our chart. So again, this is some um, data from David Brown um, at the mixing conference in 2010. Those are the circles. The diamonds now are data measured by um, in our lab using the particle image velocimeter. So here are the um, narrow blade hydrofoils. Here are the pitch blade turbines, flat blade turbine, Rushton turbines, and here's the sawtooth blade. That's the efficiency of the sawtooth impeller is less than 1% in term, as a pump. So it's therefore a very efficient um, disperser. So if we look at the narrow blade hydrofoils, there's a range of efficiencies from about 33% to 47%. The, the diamonds here are hydrofoils that we sell. The LSV is a narrow blade hydrofoil. We've got some uh, um, anti-ragging impellers used for the waste in wastewater treatment. Here's a pitch blade turbine. Um, so the, the message of this chart is there's no magic. There are no magic impellers. All the narrow blade hydrofoils are equally as efficient as each other. What we believe we can bring to the table is deciding, well, which type of narrow blade hydrofoil is the appropriate one for your process, or should it be a pitch blade turbine? Now, what we're missing in this analysis of, of um, efficiency is the impeller to tank diameter ratio. So the low efficiency hydrofoils are small diameter relative to the tank. The best efficiency are large diameter. Same is true for the pitch blade turbines. So what we're missing is the effect of the impeller to tank diameter ratio. So there's an alternative way of looking at the efficiency, and that's simply to define the efficiency as the mass of fluid pumped per unit of energy input by the mixer. And so we're simply taking the uh, flow rate divided by the power input, multiplying by the density, and we end up with this fairly simple equation, flow number over power number, speed times diameter squared, and it has units of kilograms per joule. So let's compare the impellers at constant power per unit mass. This is the equation for the average power input per unit mass by the uh, uh, impeller. The densities have cancelled out here. Rearrange to express it in terms of the impeller speed, Substitute into our equation for the flow efficiency. And now we have an, an expression that takes into account the impeller to tank diameter ratio. This efficiency is not dimensionless. It, as it, it's a, a function of power input per unit mass and the tank diameter. And we can explain that, I'm not going to explain it today, but there's, there's a good reason for this. So we're going to plot the, the flow efficiency versus the impeller to tank diameter ratio at one watt per kilogram power input per unit mass and a tank diameter of one meter. So here's our chart. So we have a, the orange circles are the narrow blade hydrofoils. The green circles are the pitch blade turbines. Here's the flat blade. Here are the Rushtons. Here's the sawtooth. So generally, as the power number goes up, the mass flow efficiency goes down. And this group of pitch blade turbines over here, um, we've got a narrow, small projected height. We've got a six blade. We've got a 60 degree. As the power number goes up, the efficiency goes down. So if we have a process that we know is governed by flow, we're going to choose an, a, a hydrofoil, roughly half the tank diameter, to be the impeller to use in our process. Evidence is pretty clear. So now what we have to think about is shear. 
the shear rate. So in our fluid mechanics textbooks, we see uh, a cartoon that looks like this. We have a, a plate with area A separated by a gap Y from another plate, um, and the gap is filled with the liquid that we're interested in. We apply a force to the upper plate and it accelerates till it's traveling with a velocity V. And the shear rate is a velocity gradient. Uh, so the, v, the velocity, v, velocity is V here, zero here, separated by a gap Y, and that is the shear rate. But it's only valid, that definition of shear rate is only valid in laminar flow, and that, that's part of the problem. So Jim Olchu uh, wrote a book, 1983, Fluid Mixing Technology, and this chart is taken from his book. So the A3 series impellers are the hydrofoils, the A2 series, like the A310, for example, the A2 series, A200 are the pitch blade turbines. So he says that because the velocity gradient of the from the hydrofoil is shallower than for the pitch blade turbine, it's a lower shear impeller. Okay, this is these are velocity profiles measured in our lab for a pitch blade turbine, and the LSV is our narrow blade is the narrow blade hydrofoil. So if we eyeball some triangles, some gradients on, onto these uh, measurements. Yes, the hydrofoil is lower shear than the pitch blade turbine. And we can do the same for the Rushton turbine pumping radially out towards the wall. We can get this gradient. And we can read off coordinates on the length scale and the velocity scale. And we're going to normalize the, um, the position with the radius of the impeller, and we're going to normalize the velocity with the tip speed. So we have four coordinates that we need in order to compare the gradients. So the shear rate is alpha minus beta times the tip speed, psi minus omega times the radius of the impeller. So here's the alpha, beta, psi, and omega. Here's the value of lambda. And here are the ratios of the shear rate at equal tip speed and equal average power input per unit mass normalized by the hydrofoil. So yes, on this basis, the hydrofoil is low shear, pitch blade turbine somewhere in between, and the Rushton is high shear. So let's look at a process result that's dependent on shear, and that's the dispersion of oil in water. So we're looking at silicone oil, low volume fraction, so that the mechanism of breakup is, is so that the, the mechanism that controls the drop size is breakup. There's no coalescence happening or minimal coalescence. And so the drop, the, 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 the physical mechanism um, of the breakup is, is described in a paper from Hinzer in 1955, classic paper in the world of mixing. So we're going to look at data for five impellers, a Rushton, two pitch blade turbines, a hydrofoil and a sawtooth blade. Data are measured by the FMP consortium in the UK. And similar work was done by Andre Pacek at the University of Birmingham and um, in conjunction with Kemeny. So let's look at the data. First thing to say is that the, the measurement of diameter is expressed as D, it's called D32. It's the Sauter mean diameter. And it's a measure of the drop size distribution. It's not a single, single it's a single value representing the, the distribution. So let's look at the data. The red diamonds are the Rushton, the pale blue and the yellow are the pitch blade turbines. Dark blue is the hydrofoil, and the green down here is the sawtooth blade. So at the same average power input per unit mass, the sawtooth blade makes the smallest drops, which we would expect, but the hydrofoil makes smaller drops than the Rushton, which is somewhat, it's counterintuitive com compared to what the conventional wisdom is, is telling us. So we're missing something in our understanding of how the impeller is putting energy into the system. So what's missing? What's missing is the train vortex. So modern aeroplane wings have tips because a training vortex forms at the tip of an aeroplane wing and the, the tip disrupts the vortex. The, the, the training vortex increases the drag on the blade. So what's happening is there's a high pressure zone on the front of the blade or on the underside of the wing. 
there's a low pressure zone on the back side of the blade or the upper side of the wing. And where the high pressure zone and the low pressure zone meet, this vortex is formed. The local energy dissipation rate within the trailing vortex is orders of magnitude, an or at least an order of magnitude that can be two orders of magnitude higher than the average within the vessel. So what we need to be able to do is to capture the physics of the vortex, calculate the local energy dissipation rate, and try and, try and con compare liquid drop size to, to that measure of, of mixing intensity. So this, is, this isn't mo it's computer modeling. This is data. This is measured using a device called particle image velocimetry. And the interesting thing, so we're just looking at one blade going past, but look out here and you can see that the, the, the end or the, the, the vortex that has been produced by the blade in front of this one. So powerful tool. Now we can also do CFD modeling. So this is using a time dependent um, code, large eddy simulation from a, a company called MSTAR Simulations. And the red, the red area, we're looking at the vorticity of, of the vortex. And you can see there's a vortex coming off the blade above and below. So what's, what's missing? What has been missing before? If we time average those velocities, whether measured with the PIV or estimated or predicted using CFD, we'll get the classic parabolic velocity profile that we see from uh, time averaged measurements. Time average measurements are not capturing what's going on in the trailing vortex. And this term is, it, 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 it's important. We need to be able to do that. So looking back at the conventional wisdom and where it comes from, it comes from uh, measurements that were made. We're not able to look at the time dependency of, of the vortex coming or the vortices coming off the blades. We have more powerful tools, we have more powerful computers, and we're able to look much more closely at what's going on in a stirred tank. And that's allowed us to make this new analysis and understanding of the and quantification of, of the trailing vortex properties. So let's here's a, here's a, a snapshot of our trailing vortex. You can see the see the the vortex right here. So there's two things we can extract from this picture. First is the velocity. And the second is the size. So the kinetic energy per unit volume is a constant times the density times that velocity squared within the trailing vortex. The, the time scale of the vortex is the length scale, L sub V, divided by the velocity. And the energy dissipation rate is the kinetic energy divided by the time scale, or expressing it in terms of the velocity, velocity cubed divided by the length scale. So Rule of thumb for turbines, Russian turbines, pitch blade turbines, the length of the training vortex, length scale of the training vortex is roughly one half of the projected height of the blade. For hydrofoils, it's equal to the projected height of the blade at the tip. So we've got the kinetic energy, we've got the local energy dissipation rate. Now we want to do something with those numbers. So in our article in chemical engineering, we've shown that for impellers with blades, not for the sawtooth blade, the ratio of the kinetic energy in the trailing vortex to the tip speed squared is equal to a constant times the square root of the power number. Can't explain that relationship, but the data fall out very, very clearly in, into that form. So the energy dissipation rate is the k max to the three over two divided by the length scale. If we express the length scale as the diameter divided by a constant, which we can measure, we've got that the energy dissipation rate is a constant times x, that ratio times the kinetic energy to the three over two divided by the diameter of the impeller. We're going to take the value of the constant of proportionality equal to what? Well, for all the impellers. And we could talk about the the validity of that assumption, but um, whatever form we use, we're going to apply the same constant to every impeller. So we're going to skip some algebra and mathematics, and we're going to skip to the results. So the ratio of the maximum energy 
max train vortex energy dissipation rate to the average power per mass is here's the equation that we get to but we've skipped its derivation here's the divide or multiply by one over the power per unit mass simplify and that ratio is weakly dependent on the power number the type of impeller to, it's proportional to the ratio but it's strongly dependent on the tank to impeller diameter ratio so why is that if we look at impellers uh, a small diameter versus a large diameter at the same power input which is the way we're doing this comparison a small diameter impeller has to run at higher tip speed higher tip speed gives me higher local energy dissipation rate in the trailing vortex and that's captured by this t over d cube term right here so here are the results. So these, the X, the power number, and the D over T are actually measured values. They're not the values that you'll get if you substitute into the um, equations as a standard deviation of plus or minus 10% on that correlation. So the, the constants, the K value, the ratio of the maximum to the average for the Rushton is 70, 45 degree pitch blade is 75, 60 degree pitch blade is 83, then for the hydrofoid, it's 260, and the sawtooth blade, 3300. So normalizing by the um, Rushton, the turbines, um, Rushtons and pitch blades, all falling within 20% of each other. So the hydrofoil is about four times higher, and the rush sawtooth is nearly 50 times higher. So let's simply take that analysis and apply it to the data that we looked at earlier for the um, at comparing drop size at the average power per unit mass. Everything lines up. And the Rushtons, the pitch blades, the hydrofoils, down here's the sawtooth blade. So if I want to make a drop of 100 microns, I can do that with a hydrofoil, with a Rushton, with either of the pitch blade turbines. Provided that I have an energy maximum energy dissipation rate of about 30 watts per kilogram. But the power input, the average power input per unit mass with each impeller will be different. So, best impeller for pumping, large diameter hydrofoil, around half the tank diameter. Best impeller for shearing is going to be small diameter, high tip speed, small power number. Um, maybe even if we want to go as high as a, uh, a sawtooth blade, the R R500. So this is this is all well and good. Now let's look at some other examples of um, processes that are governed by shear. So the first is uh, mixing and flocculation of fine particles in wastewater treatment and, and polymer treatment, shear-induced flocculation. So in the wastewater treatment industry, there is a, a concept called the G-value. It's a, a shear rate. And those of you who have studied fluid mechanics, studied turbulence, may recognize that this is actually the reciprocal of the Kolmogorov timescale. So a customer defines the G value they need for their process, the volume of the basin in which the water treatment is taking place, the viscosity of the water might change a little bit with temperature, but it essentially size is the power required from the agitator. So the customer can define the G value, or there is a test in the water treatment industry called jar tests. And there's a link down here that you can click on if you're interested in uh, finding out how that's done. So this is a picture taken from Pat Spice's PhD. Pat did a PhD at the University of Cincinnati. And the data we're going to look at is comes from his PhD. So what he the way he describes the, um, the evolution of flock sizes, we've got these small particles. And in his experiments, he was uh, taking polystyrene particles of about 815 nanometers. They collide, they stick, and they grow. And they grow in sort of random directions, getting longer. And as they get longer, they'll eventually start to break and reorganize themselves, restructure, and become more compact over time. So as we look at the time history of the of the flock size, it gets longer, it gets longer, and then it gets shorter. <clears throat> so the way Pat analyzed his data was something called the number average maximum flock length. 
So we're going to plot, heat, plot the number average maximum flock length versus time. So this is one of the examples from his um, work. I'm not going to uh, um, show the others just in the interest of time. But as we can see, the flock gets bigger and then it, it settles down and it ends up at a kind of equilibrium size. So what we're going to do is for all the experiments, we're going to take the final three values, take the average of those three values and the standard deviation. We're going to call that the final number average maximum flock length. And here's the, here's the data. So we've got three G values, three impellers, nine data points. And as we can see right now, the Rushton makes larger flocks than the hydrofoil at the same G value. And the G value is, is being described based on the average power input per unit mass. So what happens if we define G in terms of the maximum energy dissipation rate in the trailing vortex. And this is all we've done. That's all we've done. Calculated the maximum energy dissipation rate in the way that I described it earlier. And here's Pat's data. Uh, I've done nothing with it. And when I first saw this analysis, I thought I'd made a mistake. I, I went back and I checked it twice. I was so surprised. So the, the relative, there's, the standard deviation less than 5%. Now, a couple of interesting points here. This is from the Rushton and the Hydrofoil making the same flock size. The G max is 330 reciprocal seconds. The maximum energy dissipation rate is about uh, 0 0.011 watts per kilogram. The average of the final three data points, 204, 187 microns, but the power input by the Rushton is three times higher than it is from the hydrofoil because it's not as efficient at creating shear. So we can tune, we can tune our selection of the impeller if we if we want shear, or do we not want shear? We want to promote growth, whether it's crystals or um, flocks in wastewater treatment. So another example mycelia size in fermentation. So this is work that was done by a group in France uh, in conjunction with Alvin Nina, who's an emeritus professor at the University of Birmingham, very well known in the field of gas liquid mixing and, and bioreactor mixing. So Trichoderma rhesii is a mycelial, is, is a fungus. It wants to it wants to grow clumps. It's more productive when it's allowed to, to grow. So if we're going to make the fermentation productive, we need to control the shear experience that the, but the, the, the bugs uh, have during the fermentation. So this is a chart from the, their paper. There's a number of charts that look like this. This is simply the growth rate versus three measures of um, mixing intensity, tip speed, the average power per unit volume, and something they call the energy dissipation circulation function, epsilon max, and I'll explain what that means in a second. So <clears throat> based on tip speed, oh, and the other point to make, the, the circles and the squares down here are lab data. The X is 100,000 liter production ferment. So tip speed, got an error of plus or minus 34%, uh, power per volume goes down to 20%, Energy dissipation circulation function, the error is five and a half percent. So what does this mean? The energy dissipation circulation function is the epsilon max, the maximum energy dissipation rate in the trailing vortex, as we've described its calculation, divided by the circulation time. Or it's the epsilon max multiplied by the frequency at which the packets of, of fungi, the mycelial clumps, pass through the high shear zone. It's essentially the intensity of the high shear captured through epsilon max multiplied by the frequency of the event, one over the circulation time. So the large scale fermenter is, is much more productive, has a higher growth rate than the lab units. So, so why is this? As we scale up at constant power per unit mass, and in, in this case, the power per unit mass has actually gone down, the circulation time gets longer. So the frequency of those high 
shear events goes down. So the bugs are more productive. They don't experience the shear as often. So we've got three pieces of experimental evidence, two of which are out of my control and my colleagues' control, that show that the, this concept of epsilon max, the training vortex energy dissipation rate, is the correct way to quantify the shear in a stern tank, low viscosity, turbulent flow. So given that, what does a low shear impeller look like? So there are many processes that require low shear to promote growth of a dispersed phase. Flocculation in wastewater treatment, coagulation, uh, crystallization. So what does a low shear impeller need geometrically? It should have a large diameter and a large projected height. It should have a large power number, high power number, and a low tip speed. So what do we sell to accommodate that requirement? So what we sell, here's the, pic, here's the model. It looks like a bit like a Star Wars uh, Empire fighter, I suppose. But it's a, it's a, 45, it's a 75 degree pitch blade to combine the two blades. Um, and here's a drawing. This is a, this, these are impellers that are installed in a, a crystallizer just over one meter in diameter has a power number like a Rushton turbine, but it pumps like a, a, um, like a pitch blade turbine, like an axial flow impeller. So do we have any evidence to support this statement? And the answer is yes, we do. So we have been quantifying shear by looking at drop size in liquid-liquid dispersions. So on this chart, we're looking at drop sizes measured by the FMP consortium in the UK, presented at the 16th European Conference on Mixing in Toulouse. So we've got th these triangles are hydrofoils, two from two different vendors, and they make the same drop size at the same average power input per unit mass because they have the same power number and the same projected blade height. The squares are pitch blade turbines. The, the red ones are standard, the purple are wide. The wide blade Pitch blade turbine makes bigger drops than the standard pitch blade turbine because it has a higher power number, larger projected height, and runs at a lower tip speed. Then we have our Sentinel SLS impeller. So at the same average power input per unit mass, it makes the largest drops because it's the lowest shear impeller. So these, these measurements are made in 30% silicone oil. Um, stabilized with a surfactant called Turgitol in distilled water. And this is uh, the technique that the FMP consortium have developed. Um, it's, it's very reliable in terms of being able to, to measure and, and, and produce uh, drop sizes in experiments. So where do we go with this understanding? So we're going to buy a machine or use a machine or sell a machine that is transferring energy a motor, a gearbox, a shaft, and an impeller. We're buying electrical energy from the power company, which spins the motor. The motor spins the gearbox and the shaft and the impeller. So we're converting electrical energy into mechanical kinetic energy. Th that mechanical kinetic energy is then being transferred to the fluid in two ways. The first is the mean flow kinetic energy, treating the impeller as a pump. And through the appropriate choice of the impeller geometry, blade angles, we can, can have produce predominantly axial flow, predominantly radial flow, or some combination of the two. The other thing we can then control is the, the energy dissipation rate in the trailing vortex. Do we need shear or do we want to minimize shear? And we can control that ratio through impeller selection. And as I said earlier, there are no magic impellers. What we can do is bring to the table our experience and expertise in being able to make that control through the appropriate impeller selection. So conclusions. Um, an impeller in a stirred tank is a pump. We can calculate the power, the flow, the shear, and its efficiency. The conventional wisdom describing impeller character, impeller's characteristics is wrong. And I, I had a phone call with someone about a month ago who was 
who told me that narrow blade hydrofoils are low shear impellers. And I went through this information with them, and I think I managed to convince them that that's not quite right. So high shear impellers have high energy dissipation in the trailing vortex. They have a small diameter relative to the tank, maybe a one quarter to one third, small projected height and a high tip speed. Low shear impellers have a low energy dissipation in the trailing vortex, large diameter and projected height and a low tip speed. And this new character characterization is supported by experiments in shear sensitive processes. So we are going to want to talk to you, the customer, whether it's a new process or an existing process, about your process result. What are you trying to achieve in your stirred tank? And we then are going to help you choose the appropriate impeller geometry to optimize the necessary balance between shear and flow to use the energy input by the mixer most effectively. And, and energy, energy usage, energy conservation right now is a very hot topic in many industries. So that's my final chart. Um, so this is the this ends today's presentation. And I'm now going to begin our question and answer session reading from the chat. So let's start from the top with your questions. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you for spending your time with us. And um, I hope you learned something. So let's get going with the questions. Thank you. So there've, we've had a few questions. Um, I will endeavor to answer them. Uh, the first one was one about liquid level. So there's this concept, this idea of the process result. So as part of the description of the process, one of the questions we're going to ask is, what's the level? What's the, what, what are the range of operating levels? So if you have a continuous stirred tank reactor that's going to run at a constant level for two years, that's very different to having a batch reactor where the level is going to be going up and down over time. So the answer to that question is it depends. It depends on, on what you're trying to do in, in your process and what are, what are the range of levels that you would expect to um, to see. Uh, there was a question about Reynolds number. So I said you can calculate Reynolds number and also you can calculate power number if you use a consistent set of units. And so as a question asked about the person who asked the question says, I use a, a factor of 10.5, but they use a set of units where it's the specific gravity of the liquid, speed in RPM, revs per minute, impeller diameter in inches, and viscosity in center points. So that's not a consistent set of units. That So you need the 10.5 to um, calculate the correct Reynolds number. So I use SI units, kilograms per meter cubed for the density, revs per second for the speed, meters for the diameter, and the viscosity in Pascal seconds. So um, there's no correction factor because it's it essentially kilogram meter seconds a uh, system. Um, a question about can we use CFD to Get, estimate the power number of an impeller? And the answer is yes, we can. The, the modern CFD, even one of, in fact, when CFD was first being developed as a, as a tool for mixing, um, being able to calculate the power number, or estimate the power number and compare it with experimental results was um, one of the ways validate the the took the code so yes you can, i think you the answer is yes you can use cfd to um today if you have a new impeller configuration you need you you can estimate the power number but one of the things you have to be careful about is the resolution of the grid around the impeller so if you have a, a, a an impeller that's a flat blade 
you don't need as much resolution to resolve well to resolve the the geometry of the impeller as you do if you have a curved blade and we've certainly seen that you know, looking at say marine propellers which tend to have a um uh um much more curvature or, or propellers that are used in the um inside with side entering mixing um another question is there a place for square tanks versus circular tanks more volume same floor space and yes um there is a there is a place for um square tanks and and the the comment is that uh, the the person who asked the question saw this in in a paint letdown facility. Yeah, so square tanks are very common in the um, paint industry, and we have correlations that would allow us to you know we have correlations to estimate the blend time, the mixing time in a, uh, a cylindrical tank, and those correlations have been um, adjusted. There's there's an adjustable an adjustment you can make to estimate the blend time in uh in a square tank or even a even a rectangular tank um let's see what else we've got here so what about truncated bottom uh, so the question is what about a truncated bottom circular tank for hsd hsds are commonly used in 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 um cylindrical vessels I'm, I'm, you have to just remind me what do you mean by uh truncated bottom i mean i've seen disc uh, dished bases flat bases conical bases um the, generally the shape of the base uh, certainly in when we're doing liquid phase mixing has a small effect on on the overall process um if you're doing solid suspension uh the shape of the base can have quite a significant effect. If you think about, you know, if you have a flat-based vessel, um, the solids are going to collect in the corners, and you need to make sure that you have enough mixing out in the corner to be able to to suspend those solids. Similarly, if you have a fairly deep cone at the bottom of your base, the solids will tend to collect at the base of the cone. Um, so, generally, from a mixing point of view, uh, it it's not it's not in, not that it not that critical with the shape of the base um unless you've got solids in, and and as i mentioned you know flat bases conical bases you need to think a bit more about the amount of mixing you need in order to suspend the solids um any other questions any other questions let me see And efficiency discussed in the presentation are mainly for energy. Can, is there any mixing efficiency or just mixing time for this? So we're looking, we're defining the efficiency in terms of pumping. How much of the mechanical energy input by the mixer is converted to kinetic energy of the flow? And that flow is, we, we, we need that flow to achieve some results some process results something that's going on in the tank so if you look at mixing time there are correlations for mixing time that show that um, if you compare a small diameter impeller and a large diameter impeller at the same power input per unit mass in the same size tank with the same fluid the large diameter impeller will give you a shorter blend time than the small diameter impeller. And the reason for that is because it's a more efficient pump. As the, the, the blending of the contents of the tank is going to be dependent on the circulation of the fluid. And the large diameter impeller is going to circulate more fluid for a given power input than the small in diameter impeller. So, yeah, we can take the... Um, we can take this analysis of thinking that of impellers in terms of their pumping capability and and look at that in terms of the impellers ability to actually 
achieve the process result, blending, solid suspension, gas dispersion, liquid-liquid dispersion. So, I mean, one of the things that we like to do from the, you know, from the point of view of scale-up is to be able to explain the mixing process in terms of some fundamental physics and fluid mechanics and relate those physics and fluid mechanics to what governs the process. Are we making drops? Are we making bubbles? Is there a chemical reaction going on? Are we, are we simply blending two miscible liquids? The, the end result that we're trying to achieve, we have to relate back to how we're putting the energy into the system and the physics of, of, of the mixing. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Let me just see what else we've got here right now. Um, um, as we explore space, how does low to zero gravity affect mixing? I would say it affects mixing if you have a density difference in your fluids. So if you think about um, buoy buoyancy, for example, if you, you're do it dispersing a gas or, or mixing two liquids with a different density, the buoyancy term, the, the way we est you know, effect, calculate the effect of the density difference has, has acceleration due to gravity in it. So if we go into space and acceleration due to gravity goes to zero, then there's no there should be no effect of, of gravity. But if we're making a liquid-liquid dispersion or a gas-liquid dispersion, we're still going to have interfacial tension between the two phases and the effect of the dispersed phase viscosity on determining what the drop or the bubble size are going to be. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Um, the effect of baffles, shape, and back opening. So, yeah, the, what we've talked about this afternoon is in turbulent flow, in baffled vessels. So if you, if you have baffles in a tank, the, the standard sizing is to say you'd have four baffles. The width of the baffle is one twelfth of the impeller of, of the vessel diameter, sorry. And there's a gap between the wall of the tank and the baffle itself. So the problem that well, no problem that we're avoiding by having this gap is if the baffle is welded to the wall of the tank, there's going to be a dead zone behind the baffle and it's going to slow down, slow down mixing. So um, the gap allows some fluid to flow behind between the wall and the edge of the baffle and prevent that dead zone from forming. Um, as the viscosity of the fluid goes up and the Reynolds number goes down, the need for baffling will reduce. And ultimately, if you're operating with a highly viscous fluid in the laminar regime, you, you wouldn't put baffles in at all. Um, you'd operate in an unbaffled system. Um, so the shape, generally, it's a, flat, it's a flat plate. The width is equal to 1 12th of the tank diameter. The height of the plate is from the lower tangent line to just above the liquid surface. And the gap between the edge of the baffle and the wall of the tank is 1 60th of the tank diameter. So that's what, those are the numbers that we, or the ratios that we use in countries that use the in, imperial feet, inches system. So what it means is if I have a tank that's six feet in diameter, my baffle is six inches wide. In countries where we use the metric system, it's perfectly okay to make the baffle one-tenth of the vessel diameter and have the gap to be one-fiftieth of the vessel diameter. So it's not a hard, not a hard and fast rule, but you, in turbulent flow, low viscosity systems, you need to have baffles to convert the tangential circular motion of the shaft and the impeller into axial top to bottom motion of the fluid. And a, a really important example where that has to be done is with solid suspension. You need axial flow to lift the particles up. If you don't have axial flow, the 
solids will just sit on the base of the vessel uh, and, and spin around. Um, so uh, any more questions? I'm just looking in my question box. Let's see what we've got here. Um, and I would say, uh, see a few um, familiar names out there. Uh, hello to everybody. Um, so that's the last question I've got on my on my um, question and answer list. Does anyone have any last questions before we um, call it an afternoon? Okay, so I'd like to thank you. I know a number of people have, have dropped off since um, we started. So I'd like to thank you all for your time. I hope it was uh, useful to you. And if you, um, I guess we're going to be sending the recording. If you have any questions, any comments, if there's anything that's not clear, please feel absolutely free to drop me an email and I'll, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, as you can probably tell, I like to talk about mixing and, and mixing problems. So again, one last time, any other questions before we call it an afternoon? Oh, wait, there are more questions. Okay. Um, what about alternating? What about an alternating rotating agitator? So do you mean? Okay, Denny. Um, give me a call. So someone's asked for my phone number. If those of you who are interested in my phone number, you're not seeing it on the screen right now. It's area code 717-202-7976. Um, also, my email address, richard.k.grenville. Sorry, richard.grenville at spxflow.com. Denny, a washing machine. What about an alternating agitator? So in an industrial sense, if I spin my agitator one way, and then I, I'm going to have to slow it down. I have to let it slow down, come to a stop, and restart. So it's, it's feasible, but you have to make sure that the gearbox that you're using can be operated in you know, clockwise and anti-clockwise directions. Um, some can't for, for lubrication reasons. So, but, it, but if we were talking to a customer and they said, we need an agitator that can run in two directions, we would say, we can do it, but it limits the choice of, of the style of gearbox that we can sell you in order to drive, drive the agitator. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, so, Yes, uh, the, the information, my contact information will be inside the uh, um, presentation. It's probably better to um, set, drop me an email because if I don't have you in my contact list on my phone, um, well, if, if you call, leave me a message. That, uh, and Because if you're not in my contact list, it's going to send you to my voicemail. Leave me a message and I'll be more than happy to, to call you back. Okay, any other last questions before we um, pack up for the afternoon? I don't see any new questions. Um, okay, I'm going to click leave. And uh, as I said, when you've got my email address, if you have any questions, any comments, please feel free to get in touch. And as Kristen, oh no, as that, yeah, there's a please, if you would you complete the questionnaire because we're we want to make sure that we give uh, the best presentations that we can to customers, and um, your feedback is what's going to help us to do that. So, uh, again, I am going to. Click leave. Thanks again, all of you, for your time, and um, hope you have a good afternoon.